Hi, my name is Dave Wu, and I'll be hosting this podcast series on water treatment solutions. This podcast series uh, will cover water treatment using membrane filtration. Today's segment is dedicated to water reuse. What's water reuse, you may ask? Well, water reuse is treating water from municipal, produced industrial, or agricultural sources prior to releasing it back into the natural environment. Or in some cases, the water is reused in industrial or agricultural production. Um, well, joining me today is Stanton Smith. Hey, Dave. Hey. <laughs> uh, Stanton is the Senior Vice President of Sales and Marketing, and he's also uh, one of the three co-founders at Crosstech Membrane Technologies. Stanton is a 20-plus year veteran of the water industry. Uh, he's worked at um, companies such as Veolia, Water Technology, Nanostone, and Serum M. Um, and get this, uh, he holds a PhD in chemical engineering from Oxford, <laughs> all the way Oxford. Oh, no. Everyone's giggling when they hear that. Yeah, yeah. well, it, I, I always love the thing that you're a road scholar too. That's, um, that, I do that's, drive those trucks well. <laughs> <laughs> road scholar, that's pretty uh, impressive. So anyway, welcome, Stan. Thank you very much, Dave. Thanks for that. Yeah. Um, so Stan, I was wondering, uh, you know, tell me about Crosstech. Uh, you know, why did you guys, uh, what do you guys do and uh, why did you start? Crosstech with uh, Bruce Bishop and uh, and Job. Yeah, so so I'd say this. I uh, I was the late part of the founding team. I, I joined a little later, but I always have uh, have had common ground with uh, Job and Bruce, and that we, we we really think that you know technologies should be used uh, for treating water. It's the most important thing we do is make water for drinking, for society use, for uh, protecting the environment. Ultimately, Crosstech's entire mission is doing um, uh, membranes and water. It's pretty simple. However, when you think about what's out there in the space of, of companies, there are thousands of companies out there doing water treatment. What's our, our edge? What did we bring? Why was this company formed? And that real focus of our company is membrane technology, A, but also next generation, bringing it to the market, the hard stuff, the stuff that people don't want to do, quite frankly. We pick up the, the heavy lift of looking at the market needs, uh, looking at the trends as best we can. We don't have a crystal ball, but we see these trends, these trends, these needs that not for next year or the year after, but the next decade or two. What what are those trends? And we think membranes can fulfill that, that need, fill that gap. So we try to be a market-focused fo company, bringing water filtration technology that leaps the current state of the art. That's the mission. The mission is to be looking to the future and solving those problems, not just for now, but for, you know, and not to be, cheesy about it, but the next generation also thinking about the future of our children. Uh, Crosstech is really focused on on that. That sounds great. Um, I, I know you, you actually said a couple things that uh, piqued my interest, uh, uh, and I'm sure we'll get through them. Some of them is uh, the next generation of technology. I know that uh, you uh, uh, and two of the other founders, uh, Bruce uh, Bishop and, and Job, uh, you recently published a paper uh, for the AMPTA Membrane Conference. I uh, wa was wondering uh, if that's something you can talk about. Uh, yeah. Wh what was the paper about, and and uh, who was the uh, customer, and uh, you know what were some of the considerations that uh, that you talked about in that paper? So this 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 paper is 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 I hope those who attend the show come and see this one because I like this paper in particular because it shows a few years of experience, not just design and sale, and but actually real experiences, things that didn't work out as we thought, things that changed as we operated and stuff like that. So, um, uh, you know, due to confidentiality of the customer, I can say that they are a major engine manufacturer um, and uh, they, they, you probably know them, <laughs> they, are, they have a good CSR um, policy um, and they really want to do the right thing. Okay, so that's that's the the the, the company. Um, the I would say first thing I'd say is um, corporate responsibility initiated this project. Period. There was no other <clears throat> reason for this. This is a company that basically had to add in multi million dollars of equipment to do the right thing, and add stuff to go with it in an environment where there's more water than they know what to do with to buy it at low cost. So that was the driver. The project itself is about as full-fledged as you get. I, I can't imagine, I, I think I might have called it lead to gold in some LinkedIn post I did the other day to promote it a little. Um, but yeah, it's literally the worst water that you could possibly think of in a membrane 
filtration system. So the water was, uh, what was the, the, they were trying to treat the water that was so a result waters. of the manufacturing process. Of the process. manufacturing, yes. Yeah. So I'll tell you what the water is. This, this is. this is massive engine blocks being machined from, you know, flat steel to shaped steel. And to do that, it's real intensive spray of a combination of water and oil on the surface of the metal while the machining happens. CNC machining, we've all seen it. You spray lubricant and coolant combined, which is water and oil, onto this machine and they just make hundreds a day, hundreds of these engine components every day. Um, and then they, and then they um, do dye penetration testing and various testing and all of those wastewaters come in as well. But the, this is water that looks like a milk, creamy emulsion, not a very drinkable milk, but it, like, it looks like a perfectly mixed water and oil combination that is intractable. If you set it down for five days, it would look exactly the same. There's no oil floating. <laughs> you know, it's, it's intractable, oil and water. We call it a stable, chemically stabilized emulsion for all intents and purposes. Not many membranes can treat that. So what we did was we, we put that in. So that's, what, so that's basically 50% of the water that we treat. The other 50% is the 2,000 or so staff members that work there, canteen activities, you know, just human human uh, waste coming in. They call that sanitary waste. I always laugh about that. The industrial guys call that sanitary waste. That tells you what their real industrial waste looks like. <laughs> 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 so we got this sort of engine block stuff and then we got this this um, the sanity, sanitary waste. And they segregate those because they need different treatments. And so this particular facility takes this, this really hardcore engine oil and they came to us and said, yeah, let me not take credit for everything here. Crosstech is amazing. Yes, we are. But these guys always used ultra filtration to treat that since the 70s. Unbelievable. Maybe 80s, 70s, 80s. We walked in there and we just saw this, you know, clearly 80s technology. There was a beautiful, um, literally five foot tall by 10 foot wide control box with light switches on it with relays switching controls it was it was like a museum <laughs> to control but they use out filtration but they needed to do more with less space because now they were going to add in a whole lot of reuse equipment into what was just a discharge plant before and so yeah we cr cross -tech basically came in took that uh, industrial waste applied ceramic cross flow membranes to treat it into a oil-free and I should say emulsion free solution that was then ready to go to biological treatment so it goes from there to a biological treatment to consume the remember that ceramic ultrafiltration removes particles and oil what's left is dissolved material that's biodegradable and so the biodegradable part was then mixed with the the sanitary waste remember what we call sanitary waste well, it blended together and fed to a membrane bioreactor so another membrane plant which was uh, designed to you know hold keep the bugs in a good concentration and then the effluent from the bioreactor then goes to a reverse osmosis plant for 90 percent water recovery and that 90 percent permeate goes back to two major applications cooling tower for cooling the facility the production facilities all the machining needs cooling and to boil a feed water to produce uh, power um, to produce uh, steam around the plant for production activities. So I think what I heard you say is their existing ultra filtration, which they've been using since the 1970s. And uh, maybe you can explain what was it missing? Was it just it was not properly breaking down the oils? And so I guess my real question is uh, you talked about this old technology using or old configuration, I should say. Uh, they have this ultra filtration, and what did uh, Crosstech come in in your paper? What did you add? Yeah, good question. I, I, that technology was cutting edge in the 70s and 80s, and if you don't mind indulging me, we can uh, speak about this for one second. Uh, Crosstech CEO Bruce Bishop, uh, many years ago, started working in a company called Ceramem. Ceramem's founder, now here we go back another generation, was the first employee of a company called Abcor, and Abcor in the 70s and 60s, 60s, invented this tubular UF concept, 60s. So the CEO of Crosstech worked, was the first employee, I think, for Ceramem, but the founder of Ceramem was the first employee for Abcor. And those tubes were the bee's knees in the 60s. No one could do what those things do. They were amazing ultrafiltration membranes. And believe it or not, they're still in use, but the problem with those was walking into the engine facility was that they were just huge, just unbelievably huge. A lot of what we're doing now 
has to address more than the beautiful science. It's got to address retrofit. It's got to address existing facilities, especially in the U.S. People don't like to break out concrete walls to do stuff anymore. If our reuse project had another building that had to be built, it might have killed it right there. So instead of doing that, we saved about 60% of the area floor space for that wastewater building to, by, cha by changing technologies. Same concept, ultrafiltration, same even process configuration, cross flow. But we went to something that was, you know, I don't know, 50 feet by 30 feet to something that's a quarter of that. Now you've freed up enough space to do the other water treatment that enables you to do re reuse in that same floor, floor space. So that was a, ma a major step for that. The other, and that's one piece. The second piece, no, no building means lots of savings, right? The second thing is we, um, we were more reliable. Products, materials have changed. You went from a polymeric membrane to a ceramic membrane. Ceramic membranes in their very nature are hydrophilic. Hydrophilic being oil-hating, oil water-loving. And so that emulsion would routinely clog up those, those tubular polymeric membranes and their cleaning frequencies were pretty high. Okay, on a production site like this with over 50, 60 different production trains spitting water out at any one time to the wastewater plant, you got to be nimble. Ceramics are robust, they're cleanable, they offer an improved materials, almost optimal for oil emulsion treatment. So it's a, it's a combination of retrofit, right, and materials and configuration change that really moved that forward. So what were some of the key challenges at this engine manufacturing plant uh, as they were considering upgrading their um, their equipment? Yeah, Dave, so I said this. I, um, I, I, that would, would have been started in 2015 when this discussion started with the customer. They had uh, two, two things happening at the same time. One is they were formulating their corporate social responsibility goals, A, and they said, we got to achieve these certain water reduction requirements. So that was what they part of the driver for this. The second driver was that this plant was built, you know, in the 70s and had a wastewater plant which was dating to that time. And their wastewater plant at that time had simply two pieces to it. It had a, a, a treated the uh, industrial wastewater with an ultrafiltration system, circa 60s technology, and then also had a post ultrafiltration system to treat the dissolved organics in the ultrafiltration filtrate as long as well as the sanitary waste on site. That was made simply for discharge to the local publicly owned treatment works. So here we have a, a plant that's already in existence for 40 years um, and they do discharge uh, to the local city and they want to take that and create a all new brand new recycle plant because they've now decided that they need to do better and more for the community by reusing water. So all that said, now you've got to think about all the million things that go into that. You have this building, a wastewater building, with a limited footprint. When we walked in there, we couldn't believe it. This beautiful 1960s technology took up half the building, right? But it, but it was ultrafiltration, and it had a bunch of problems associated with it. It was old, it was, it was aging, it was operating intensive. It was made of polymeric membranes, which are really was the only choice in the 60s and 70s for treating this kind of treat, uh, wastewater with emulsions. But the time has arrived uh, pretty much 20 years already. By that time, ceramic membranes have been used. So, you know, there was, it was ripe for change. It solved two problems by doing that. We could engineer a system which is much, much smaller. So now you freed up footprint for installing additional equipment for reuse inside the existing building, saving a lot of money and just time to achieve your goals, construction cost and construction time. So we hit that goal there. So you're hitting sort of the key things we were talking about earlier. You're talking about existing infrastructure retrofit. You're hitting um, improved performance and better materials. You're hitting sort of operate intensity re you know, reduction. So you, you, get, you kind of look at those goals and they come right out when you, when you apply the right technologies. I should state that the incumbent membrane product was still a strong company and still in existence. And they were part of the evaluation. So what was in their favor? They've done it for 30 years with that thing. They know the enemy they're facing. The new technology to them was new, ceramic membranes, had to be proven. 
So you yeah. mentioned uh, several things. Um, uh, one was uh, the existing footprint. It's not like they're going to build a new building or expand things. So big advantage to fit into the existing space. Yeah. Um, but in that existing space, the new technologies, uh, from what you're telling me, a smaller footprint allowed you to add in uh, new configurations, which made the whole system uh, much more um, efficient. Um, That's right. And uh, materials. Uh, can, what, Underpinnings yeah. of success of this project was the ceramic material. Ceramics. Yeah. So it was all about ceramics against polymeric. And that's I assume correct. that's actually... That's a theme in our day-to-day -day living in Crosstech, right? And is that is, is that what's going to be presented in the paper? You're going to be yes, discussing correct. those? We're going to be discussing those, and I'm pretty sure that there'll be lots of questions because that is the dilemma or the question of the day. So here's the funny thing. Everyone loves ceramics when they hear the technical aspects. Right? I remember presenting ceramic membrane solutions in the early 2000s to people saying, this is perfect, look at the performance, we got an installation somewhere, and they just look at me and they go, well, what's the price? Because back then, they were so expensive, they had nothing in their favor, no scale, no adoption, no, no, you know, no real um, broad-based supply chain. And now, it's different. We got volume on many of these supply chains, we got better pricing. They were never questioned technically. They were just like, oh, well, we might as well make it out of gold. Then, <laughs> <laughs> so, so the prices come down. The prices come down, and, and that's in 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 a way you're saying that's why now is the time. It's the time. It's yeah. the time because and I think the people will see down. the value is right. This particular project was nice indication on that front end on the UF portion because it was UF to UF. I felt it was an unfair evaluation because they didn't give us the building savings. <laughs> True, but they just did, they said, well, you know, let's just keep merit to merit. They called them. I'm like, wait a minute, we saved you a building. Anyway, it was still, um, so what happened was this ceramic member was capital, capital, 20% more capital, and but the life cycle saving over 20 years was 30%, including the high capital. And the operational um, you know, intensity was a fraction. It was, uh, it had better warranties because it's pretty easy to warranty ceramics now because you know the conditions of operation are, these things are baked to 2000 Celsius, okay? You're not going to wreck them with anything you're doing in water and wastewater. So a lot of it was giving them comfort. The demonstration, we performed a one month demonstration on site with a small version of the uh, technology, showed them the life, the power, the membrane capabilities to perform as well or better. So a lot of that demonstration occurred in, in on site. A lot of it was to give the site comfort because it's hard to turn away from something you've done for 20 to 30 years. And so we understood that and we did that. And no matter what people say, you never make money on demonstrations and testing. You lose money, but it's worth it in this case because we've earned a customer for life and, and we are building similar facilities at their other similar technology into their other facilities as well. So yeah. what you're saying is uh, a lot of these results were or are currently quantifiable. Absolutely. And um, you also talked about the um, the pilot that was run for about a month, but also uh, how long has it been in operation for? Yeah, so we, st and I, I was, I went just after startup because um, I'm trying to think, so it's been in operation about three years now, if okay. not more, um, and running full time. This is one of those that, 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 there's no other options when you have emulsion, you gotta run. There's no like, oh, just put into a bucket. This project is fantastic in that we are doing two things. We have concentrated that oil emulsion. We don't disappear the oil to something, you know, we concentrate to a volume that's so small and so concentrated that someone can put it into a burner. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, 20, 20 to 30,000 gallons a day of water being uh, turned into something like 3,000 gallons a week of concentrated oil. Um, and it just gets removed as a small weekly dump and someone just puts it in a burner. It's that concentrated. So, yep. so it's kind of an interesting way of, of getting rid of, uh, of oil. Um, so, yeah. uh, you know, so from the results, uh, one month pilot, uh, yeah. uh, then it's been deployed uh, in production and operation right. for the last three years. Yeah. Um, so I assume uh, the customer is, uh, is happy? Customer is happy. We are getting the second project undergoing with them. Um, the I credit to the facilities engineer that, site who you know said i want to do this it's different it's easy for him to say i'll just do what everyone else has done before so he, he's a wonderful um an ambassador for you know, a, a person whose main life his main focus in life is not water but looked at it and said i think i want to do things better so there's definitely credit there to the end user um he's not a fast follower but an early adopter it's very okay. very important and then we have the um the performance of the system has been extremely um let's say satisfying it's, it's performed 
no, there's bumps in the road, believe me. We lost one cross flow pump, there's two cross flow pumps, and there was this operational challenge, and we got this call saying this thing is not performing well. There's always those moments. We go out there, we solve the problem, it comes back on. We do some deep cleaning for a couple of days. We do some pump management, put some more sensors on to make sure when this happens again, it doesn't doesn't cause a problem. So, but, but this is the real bumps and knocks of a, of a reuse plant. But as far as it goes, that's about the worst thing that happened and it's running for three years. I'm pretty happy with it. Okay. Membranes are still in place, the exact same membranes. So it's running for one. three years. Uh, you've got repeat business. It's all quantifiable. The numbers are there. Uh, yeah. These are all things that um, you're presenting in the paper at Ampta. That's right. That's well, right. uh, that's uh, pretty awesome. And so, um, uh, actually, what I'd like to do is conclude this podcast and thank you for all of your insights. Uh, of course, uh, what we are really would like uh, people who are listening to this, we invite you to listen in to uh, some of the presentations uh, that the Crosstech team is doing. Uh, this yeah. is actually one of them, uh, this, yeah, case this, study, one of them. this case study. This case study is one of them. Yeah. Yeah, on and it the, will expand to the reuse portion as well. Uh, I was focusing on the fantastic you know, front end of the process, but there's, there's this sort of bioreactant and this 90% RO. Considering, like I said, lead to gold, the nastiest water can ever imagine, becoming boiler feed water, which is kind of the highest quality of water you can feed into any equipment. So it's a lead to gold story. And it's, it's pretty fascinating because there's actually years of data to share. And you can ask the presenter, please ask the presenter, our CEO who is actually presenting a paper because he, he was really instrumental in getting this up and running in the early stages. He's from that part of New York. He wanted to definitely have a, oh, that's right. something, He's you know, do New York. something for, right. for where he came from. Um, and uh, so he was definitely on site as part of this. He was very excited um, about it to be in like 20 minutes from his home, uh, hometown where he grew up. And of course, he's a Red Sox fan now. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if he's allowed back. Um, but but I think there's two other there's two other presentations from Crostic. So we have three podium presentations. We're proud of it. We we we, and they're all exciting new stuff. That's what that's what we do, and we do and we have a poster as well. And I'm having the privilege of presenting a roundtable on ceramic membranes. So if you want to pick my brain about ceramic membranes, it's not much there. But come bring bring your own. Bring your own stuff to share, please, and I'll be happy to, to lead that session. It's uh, it's also part of the show. All right. right. Well, thank you very much, Stanton. And um, uh, we will uh, look forward to uh, seeing uh, people at the presentations that we have. And uh, please stay tuned for our future podcasts. Well, thanks, Dave. You, you, you did a great job in this, extracting useful information from me. That's unusual and difficult. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, Stanton. Thank you.